We will be talking about non-medical cannabis in light of its national and provincial legalization. You'll notice that we use the term non-medical instead of recreational when discussing cannabis. When you think about recreation, we often think of recreation paths or activities that are associated with healthy behaviors. In order to avoid the correlation of cannabis with healthy behaviors, we will be using the term non-medical throughout the presentation. The presentation will be about 60 minutes long. The first portion of our presentation may be familiar material for you as we cover what cannabis is, the legalization, and its impact on the adolescent brain. With that common understanding of cannabis, we'll discuss parent strategies you can use at home, at work, or in the community as an adult ally or coach to youth you know. Cannabis legalization is complex and changing. It is hard to keep on top of all the information that is coming at us. It may be helpful to know that your school, the local enforcement, and your community will all have a role to play. If you have questions, there will be people in the community to reach out to you. Public health's role is about health and keeping you healthy. We are here to provide you with the best information that we know to help you make informed decisions for you and your family. We recognize that there is a lot of information and it is changing almost daily. Throughout this presentation, I will point out where we got this information. Public health role promotes health of the whole population through education and awareness. Public health approach to cannabis also includes a harm reduction approach. Whatever your experience with cannabis, we can be a source of information that will keep you safe, inform your decisions, and support you and your family. And surveillance. Public health collects data to tell us what happened yesterday, what we're seeing today, and through research we can identify effective approaches to reduce risks and harms. We will cover five parenting strategies that are meant to deter or delay the onset of substance use. We will discuss how to talk to your child about cannabis. These strategies can be transferable to other substances such as alcohol and tobacco and opioids. We will leave you with resources and supports that are available to you, your family, and your community. After alcohol, cannabis is the most commonly used psychoactive drug in Canada. Cannabis, also known as marijuana, is a product of the plant cannabis sativa. It has other names such as Mary Jane, grass, weed, and smoke. Cannabis consists of dried flowers, fruiting tops, and leaves, and is commonly greenish or brown in color. The main active chemical in cannabis is THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol. THC is a mind-altering psychoactive chemical that gives a euphoria or high to those who use it. Another active chemical in cannabis is CBD, or cannabidiol. This is used for medical purposes and is presently being studied. It does not have psychoactive properties. CBD and THC usually come in a ratio to each other. The higher THC content, the higher effects and related health risks. There are different ways to use cannabis. They include smoking as a cigarette, joint, or blunt, vaporized in a pipe, bong, or e-cigarette called vaping, mixed in a drink or food called edibles, and consumed as a cannabis tincture, an alcohol-based extract, or added to food or drink, heated and inhaled, called dabbing, as oil or in a form called shatter, that is made from cannabis resin or hash. This form contains high levels of THC. Synthetic cannabinoids, sometimes called K2 or spice, are a relatively new class of products. Synthetics are a large group of chemicals that mimic the cannabinoids found in the plant. They generally have severe psychoactive impacts and health risks and should be avoided. The chemical contents of synthetic cannabinoid products are unknown, untested, and its potency differs between brands. This inconsistency, as well as the limited research on the product, makes it difficult to predict the long and short-term health harms. The method of consumption is important to consider for their unique risks. When cannabis is smoked or vaporized, the effects begin right away and last at least six hours. The effects of edibles may begin between 30 minutes and two hours after taking them, and can last 12 hours or longer. Although edibles don't pose a health risk to lungs and respiratory system as smoking does, 
it can take longer for the THC effects to be noticed and can increase the risk for overconsumption, which intensifies the effects, putting someone at risk for poisoning or other injuries. Risk for injuries and accidents can happen as a result of the THC affecting your coordination, reaction time, and ability to judge distances. Cannabis can make some people feel relaxed and happy, but it can also have less desirable effects, causing confusion, drowsiness, forgetfulness, panic, delusions, and distorted perceptions. Some other short-term effects on the body include increased heart rate and decreased blood pressure. All of these physical and short-term effects can have a negative impact on your activities of daily living, including academics, work, sports, and the ability to drive safely. Long-term effects develop gradually over time with frequent use that continues over weeks, months, or years. These effects can last several days to months or longer after you stop using cannabis. Long-term effects of cannabis can include addiction or cannabis use dependence, effects on the brain, memory, concentration, intelligence, effects on mental health, including anxiety, depression, psychosis, and effects on the physical health, respiratory, reproduction, and cardiovascular. The Federal Cannabis Act has created a strict legal framework for controlling the production, supply, distribution, sale, possession, advertising, and packaging of cannabis in Canada. The goal of this new law will help better prevent youth from accessing cannabis, displace the illegal cannabis market, and protect public health and safety with product quality and safety requirements for cannabis and road safety. The proposed act includes restrictions on several types of promotional activities that may be considered appealing to youth, promotion that includes false, misleading, or deceptive information, promotion through sponsorship, testimonials, or endorsements, and restricts promotion using the depiction of persons, celebrities, characters, or animals. Plain packaging is a part of a comprehensive, effective approach to substance control and is a strategy that has been adopted by the federal government. Criminal charges and penalties will remain in effect as they are now with testing for impairment. Provincial territorial laws will determine what additional administrative penalties may be imposed on you. Maximum growth in a household is four plants, and it will continue to be illegal to take cannabis over an international border. Under this broad federal act, the provinces have the responsibility of setting further limits such as how retail sale will look, legal age, public consumption, and impaired driving. On October 17th, when the non-medical use of cannabis legalization occurs, Ontarians will be able to buy non-medical cannabis online through the Ontario Cannabis Store in the form of fresh, dried oil and seeds. The government plans to pass legislation to put in place a private retail model for April 2019, where the Ontario Cannabis Store will continue to be the wholesaler of these retail stores. Once private stores are in place, products cannot be visible or sold to youth and must be sold from behind the counter. Promotions must be limited to factual information and cannot be appealing to youth. Sponsorships and endorsements are not allowed. Municipalities will have a responsibility in making decisions around private retail sales in their community. It is important to know the Ontario laws as they might affect some of the decisions you make. As an adult or a youth, it is much easier to make informed decisions when you have all the information. It is also important to remember that each province may differ in the laws that they have. The legal maximum age in Ontario after October 17, 2018 to purchase, use, possess, and grow cannabis will be 19 years of age. The maximum amount you can have on your person at any time is 30 grams. Ontarians will only be able to buy non-medical cannabis online through the Ontario Cannabis Store in the form of dried oil and seeds as of October 17, 2018, and storefront retails will begin 
in April of 2019. Recent amendments to the Smoke-Free Ontario Act have been proposed by the current Ontario government to include the consumption of cannabis, both medical and non-medical. The recent am amendments will prohibit the smoking of cannabis in the same places where the smoking of tobacco and the use of electronic cigarettes are prohibited. Examples of these are enclosed workplaces, enclosed public places, and other specified places. Schools and school grounds, children's playgrounds, and publicly owned sports fields are also areas where it will be prohibited to use non-medical cannabis. Zero tolerance for young, under 21 years of age, novice, and commercial drivers, or those driving a road building machine. The Centre of Addictions and Mental Health created a Canadian Lower Risk Cannabis Use Guideline resource. This provides science-based recommendations to enable people to reduce their health risks associated with personal cannabis use. The messages range from abstinence to avoiding regular use, choice of products, less risky methods of consumption, and cannabis use in driving. This resource also highlights those who are at particularly higher risk for cannabis-related harms, such as adolescents, pregnant women, or those with history or current mental health disorders. Surveillance is another role for public health. The 2017 Ontario Student Drug Use and Health Survey gives us a local summary of cannabis use indicators from grade 9 to 12 students who go to secondary school in Leeds, Granville, and Lanark. In 2017, about 74% of students in grades 9 to 12 in LGL reported that they did not use cannabis in the last 12 months prior to the survey. In earlier data, the Ontario Student Drug Use and Health Survey showed that self-reported use of cannabis increases from grade 9, where almost 22% reported use, to grade 12, where almost 60% reported use. Of those students who reported that they used cannabis in the 12 months prior to the survey, about 70% reported using it less than 10 times. When asked if they would have difficulty quitting use of cannabis, 97% of current cannabis users responded that they would have no difficulty in quitting. Of those students who reported that they used cannabis in the 12 months prior to the survey, about 68% reported using it for the first time when in secondary school, so grades 9 to 12. A further 32% reported first using cannabis in elementary school, grades junior kindergarten to grade 8. The average age for initiation, or first use, of cannabis was about 15 years old. In 2017, half of students surveyed reported that they thought that obtaining cannabis was easy to do. So what do these numbers tell us? We know that most teens are trying cannabis for the first time in secondary school. However, a third of students try in primary school. This speaks to the importance of talking to your teens about cannabis and all substances as early as possible. As parents and adult allies, we can help teens make informed decisions by giving them the information and strategies they need to navigate their world and problem solve today and in their future. We start the building of protective foundation when kids are young and we continue to build on developing their protective skills as they become more and more independent and continue into adulthood. When our children start school at age three or four, we teach them safety skills to ride the bus and cross the road. And as youth get older, the exposure to risk increases and strategies our teens use will change as they developmentally mature. Parenting along these developmental milestones continues to be important as our teens transition from elementary school through to high school and beyond. We know that students have opinions and information about legalization, so you can start the conversation there. 40% of students surveyed thought legalization was a good idea, that legalization would lead to a better, regulated, safer cannabis. 10% of non-users said that they would try it in the next 12 months if it were legalized. This suggests that legalization may increase usage among this cohort. It's important to know and have an understanding of what is motivating youth to use. This in combination with the data helps create a clearer picture of our youth's attitudes with respect to substance use. 
The Canadian Centre for Substance Abuse surveyed youth across Canada. In their 2017 report, youth described a number of factors that motivate their use. Some of the quotes they gave are up on the screen. Coping, it helps me forget about my problems. Socialize, it helps me enjoy a party. Enhancement, relaxing, curiosity, normal adolescent behavior to experiment. Independence and routine, I use it out of boredom. Some of the important reasons that you stated that they didn't use were because of the fear of consequences, negative effects on body and mind, and the stigmatizing of people who use cannabis. Adolescence is a period of rapid and significant developmental changes. These changes include puberty, dating, expansion of peer groups, coping with multiple transitions or stress, and becoming more independent. These are changing times for youth. As challenging as the teen years can feel for parents, they can also be incredibly rewarding. Teens are finding out who they are, what they believe in, their attitudes and opinions, and how they view themselves and others. You, as a parent or adult ally, can have a huge impact through this discovery. So let's dig a bit deeper and take a look at the facts about cannabis in the adolescent brain. What do we know? We know that cannabis is a chemical that is not naturally occurring in the body. We also know that adolescents are especially vulnerable to the negative effects of cannabis use because their brains are not fully developed yet. Use of substances during the teen years up to 25 years of age can cause long-term irreversible damage to the frontal lobe. This can cause problems into adulthood with decision-making, problem-solving, dealing with emotions and memory. The parts of the adolescent brain that develop first are those that control physical coordination, emotion, and motivation. The prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that controls reasoning and impulses, does not fully mature until around the age of 25. This normal behavior in adolescence includes difficulty holding back, a preference for high excitement, poor planning and judgment, and risk-taking behavior. Receptors which respond to THC are widely distributed in the brain, including areas that control attention, motivation, and memory. In the teen brain, development of these receptors is still going on, so when there is exposure to THC, the normal function of these receptors is hindered and this causes chemical changes to the cells. Delaying use protects the developing brain and allows for normal development of the prefrontal cortex. There is a strong relationship between mental illness and early regular cannabis use, especially in those who have a personal or family history of mental illness. Regular cannabis use is associated with increased risk of anxiety and depression. Cannabis is also linked with psychosis, especially among people with personal and family history of mental health illness. Heavier cannabis use combined with greater drug potency and exposure at a younger age is associated with poor school performance, further substance use, and reproductive and respiratory issues. There is public perception that cannabis is a gateway drug. During adolescent brain development, the THC can prime the brain for enhanced responses to other drugs. It does this by affecting the development of the regulation of dopamine system. Although this has been studied with cannabis, other substances such as alcohol and nicotine also prime the brain for heightened response to other drugs. It is estimated that one in six adolescents who use cannabis during their adolescence will meet cr criteria for cannabis use dependence. What are some of the signs you can look for in your teen to assess for problematic cannabis use? The Canadian Pediatric Society says that you might see declining school work and grades, abrupt changes in friends, abnormal health issues or sleeping habits, deteriorating relationships with family, less openness and honesty. Depending on the method of consumption, you may not see some of the physical signs, such as red, glassy eyes, a skunky smell, or pipes, bongs, or rolling papers. So consider your intuition or your hunch. When it comes down to it, you know your teen best. If something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. Talk to them 
early and openly about cannabis. When you are talking about cannabis, many of the same protective messages apply to alcohol and other drugs. From the research, we know that these items listed on the slide help to prevent and delay substance misuse. We know that positive relationships with caring adults, whether they are adults within the family or outside of the family, can strengthen connections and feelings of belonging. Parental monitoring can decrease the chances of substance use among adolescents and can positively affect children's friendship choices. In regards to supervised activities, adolescents who use drugs are generally more likely to participate in unstructured activities that are without adult supervision. The importance of social relationships with other adults and participation in organized activities is extremely beneficial to protect against substance use. Another item that works to prevent and delay substance use is positive peer relationships. Having friends that use alcohol and other drugs increases the chances of similar behaviors among adolescents. In contrast, very few adolescents who report having no friends that use alcohol and drugs have tried drugs themselves. A sense of belonging at school, home, and in the community is also important. Research has indicated that students who feel attached to their schools are less likely to engage in antisocial behavior, drug use practices, and other risk behaviors. On the other hand, a feeling of alienation or not belonging can lead to behavior problems, substance use, risk-taking, and antisocial activities. And finally, problem-solving skills includes learning and the development of skills related to assertive communication, refusal and decision-making, conflict resolution, stress management, and positive coping skills. These skills can help children in being able to navigate risk situations. Here are some parenting strategies that help put the research into action. Be a positive role model, be engaged, talk about it, set clear and realistic expectations, be in the know and know the facts. The great thing about these strategies is that they are not just specific to cannabis, but they can be used to delay and protect against all substances and risky behaviors. As a parent or influencer of youth, you have a powerful influence over your teen's risk-taking behavior. To be a positive role model, be the kind of adult you want your kids to become. Actively decide to lead by example. Really think about what you do and say and your values and opinions about cannabis and other substances. Here are some tips on how to be a positive role model. Try to model healthy stress management. Try to avoid using substances as a way to cope with stress. Rethink statements like, what a day, I need a drink. Adopt healthy ways to cope with stress, which may include going for a walk, talking about problems, and focusing on the positive things that happened during the day. The next tip is showing your teen you and others can have a good time without substances. For example, when hosting a gathering, consider providing non-alcoholic drinks. Consider also limiting your use of substances like cannabis. Consider also helping your teen connect with other positive adults. Here are some questions to discuss with your teen. Which adult outside of our family would you like to get to know better? Why? If you had a tough question that you didn't want to discuss with me, who would you go to? Being engaged is all about building a relationship with your child and showing them that you care. Maintaining parent-child relationships can become more challenging during the teen years because they may be pushing us away and spending less time with us. Essentially, we may have fewer opportunities to connect with them. Feeling connection results in an increase in resiliency, which means having the tools to cope with stress. If young people are not connected, they will find other people or things to connect to, like technology, gaming, substances, or unhealthy relationships. Here are some tips on how to be engaged. Help your teen to find their passions in life. Talk to them about activities that bring joy and energy into their life. If they are having trouble identifying something, encourage your teen to try at least one new activity or pursue a new interest. Help them to identify and explore it. Doing activities that they enjoy will increase their sense of belonging, self-confidence, and will decrease stress levels and increase coping. Be involved in their day-to-day -day life. Take an interest in their activities. Find opportunities to spend time together. 
For example, enjoying an activity together, eating meals together when you can, or going for a lunch date. Remind them that you love them on a regular basis and praise them. Praise them for making a good choice or for their efforts and achievements, such as thank you for calling me for a ride home. This will help to build their self-confidence. Be supportive. Throughout childhood, help them develop healthy coping strategies as a way to deal with stressors in life. Teens may be less likely to use substances if they have positive coping strategies in place, like going for a walk to relieve their stress. Recognize that your teen has a lot on their plate. Try to do extra things for them, like doing one of their daily chores or helping them search for something that they have misplaced. This will increase the connection, bond, and attachment between you and your child. And finally, say hello and see you later. Saying hello is all about making a connection before giving direction. So for example, say hello or ask about their day before giving orders or instructions. See you later is about bridging every separation with talk of a reunion. For example, when you drop your child off at school, let them know when you'll see them again, such as can't wait to see you after school. Strengthening connections by being engaged can open up the lines of communication. Having open and ongoing talks can delay substance use. So here are some tips for talking about substance use with your child. Talk early and often. Have conversations with your child about anything and everything and start early. Consider talking when you're both calm and relaxed and not busy. When talking about sensitive topics, it can feel uncomfortable to use direct eye contact. You can try situations where you can talk side by side, like in the car, while going for a walk, or when sitting beside each other. Let the discussion happen casually, or ask your child to let you know when they're ready to talk and be ready to listen. Look for cues they want to talk. For example, if they're hanging around the kitchen during meal prep. Announcing a sit-down meeting, like saying, we need to have a talk after dinner, can usually be met with resistance, while a more spontaneous approach will lower their anxiety and even your own. Be curious. Ask what they think. Ask for opinions, ideas, and advice. This gives a clear message that we value and respect their ideas. Young people are not always receptive to adult wisdom, and other times they just want to work things out on their own. So it's a good idea to ask if they are okay with you talking to them or providing them with advice. For example, you could say, are you okay with my asking you this? Keep an open mind. To have a productive conversation with your teen, listen without judgment. It is not always necessary to correct or express an opinion on what teenagers say and do. Reserving judgment can make them more willing to open up to us. Talk about peer pressure and staying safe. Prompt your teenager to think about potentially risky situations ahead of time and to consider what could happen as a result of choices. Role-playing and what-if questions support open communication and gives you the chance to support your child in decision-making, problem-solving, assertiveness, conflict resolution, and safety planning. Some examples of role-play could be, your friend offers you weed. How would you respond if you don't want to try it? Another example is, you are wanting to try weed for the first time with your friends. How will you reduce the potential risks? Some examples of what-if questions include, what if your friend passes out at a party after using weed and drinking alcohol? What would you do? What if your designated driver is smoking weed at the party? And finally, try active listening. Active listening is a skill that takes practice and it really works to open up lines of communication. Sum up and ask questions to show your teen you are listening and ask for their input. For example, you could say, did I get everything? Do you have anything more to add? Also offer empathy and compassion to show your teen you get it. For example, if your teen is expressing that they are feeling anxious, you could say, I'm sorry you're feeling anxious. I can imagine that must be a really difficult feeling. Can we think of some other activities that could help you relax? Use open-ended questions to start and keep a conversation going. Open-ended questions are questions that will give you more than just a yes or a no response. For example, don't you think this music is inappropriate is a close-ended question. 
Instead, consider saying, why do you think they sing so much about? When asking questions, try to avoid judgmental questions and instead ask questions that show you are curious. To start a conversation, you could try to connect with your teen through their TV shows, music, or video games. It can be easier to start with talking about someone or something else rather than talking about ourselves. With teens, use discipline strategies like discussion, negotiation, and agreed upon consequences as opposed to power and authority. Discussing and negotiating rules and consequences will help to set clear and realistic expectations that are respected. The key is to find the right balance between exerting authority when you need to and discussion and negotiating when it's appropriate and possible. Here are some tips on setting clear and realistic expectations. First, consider involving them in making decisions. Be flexible and let your teen have a say wherever possible. Give your teens the opportunity to contribute their ideas and have their opinions heard and valued. Negotiate expectations and consequences with your child or teen. Ensure they are aware of the expectations and consequences and that they agree with them. Ideally, this can be done before your teen is exposed to a situation potentially involving substances. Base rules and consequences on the age and maturity of the teen. Make sure consequences are reflective of the rule that was broken. When rules are broken, this is the time when real learning happens. Go back to the expectations and consequences that you decided on with your child or teen. Be consistent with consequences and follow through with them. Sometimes teens need to know how we are feeling, like when we are worried, frustrated, angry, or disappointed. For example, if a rule is broken. Talk about how you feel rather than how they made you feel. This is less likely to make a teen defensive and will help them understand how we feel about specific behaviors and actions. Get help from others if the teen is consistently breaking the rules. Finally, be clear what is non-negotiable. Be clear about your expectations that are not up for discussion or negotiation. You may be willing to negotiate a curfew time, for example but be clear about your expectations that are not up for discussion. For example, these items that might not be up for discussion may include hurting or mistreating people, calling you at an agreed upon time, getting in a car with a driver who may be impaired, driving impaired, getting a ride with someone you do not know, staying overnight, depending on their age and maturity. If teens are going to use substances, they tend to do it when adults are not around. So it can be important to know where they are, who they are with, and what they are doing. Try to balance this parental monitoring with giving your teen independence and adjust as needed. To maintain balance as teens become older, allow for change and more independence. Help them to take on new responsibilities. So here are some tips for being in the know. Get to know your child's friends and their parents. The more you know about their friends, the more you are likely to know about your own child and what is going on in their life. Parents also may need to talk to each other from time to time to make sure that activities are supervised. You can also try out these other tips, such as agreeing on a curfew, having your teen check in throughout the night, knowing how your teen is getting home, talking to your teen about qualities to look for in friends like honesty and respect, Educating your teen on responsible use of social media. For example, talking to them about the potential consequences of posting images of substance use on social media. To prepare for conversations with your teen on substance, try to be prepared with the facts. Remember that it's okay to not know the answer to your teen's questions about cannabis. You can admit this and try to find the answer from a reliable source with your teen. So here are some tips on knowing the facts. Consider continuing to seek out information on cannabis laws, the power of the media, and the common myths and facts on the substance. So know the law. Cannabis will be continue to be illegal for those under 19 in Ontario. Recall from earlier in the presentation that there will be other restrictions on the use of cannabis in addition to age limits, such as driving restrictions and permitted places of use. Be media smart. 
talk to your teen about how substances are portrayed and often glamorized by the media, including in social media. Companies are doing what they can to promote and sell their products, and youth are bombarded with media messaging every day in movies, on TV, online, and in social media, in commercials, on billboards, and at community events. We can support our teens by giving them the tools to critique the messages they are seeing. Help them to compare the ads on the slide with the facts you know. For example, consider tobacco ads of the past and vaping ads of the present that have glamorized smoking or vaping by making it look cool and rebellious, like the ad on the left side of our slide. When connecting with youth, it can be helpful to focus on industry practices that are targeting youth and other vulnerable groups, such as women, rather than critiquing the youth's own use of the substance. Help your teen to recognize the power of advertising by asking them questions, like do you feel alcohol, tobacco, or cannabis companies specifically target youth? How are different groups targeted by these companies? For example, are different genders treated differently? Do you feel that alcohol, tobacco, or cannabis advertising influences your younger siblings or friends? Do you feel that this advertising influences you? Recall that there are regulations on advertising of substances for tobacco and cannabis, but despite this, we do still see these products glamorized on various platforms. To prepare for conversations with your teen, it can also be helpful to know the myths and facts related to substance use. Learn about the substance, whether it is addictive, the short and long-term effects on adolescent health, the legal implications of use, and the effects of mixing substances, for example, cannabis and alcohol or cannabis and tobacco. You can see the Health Unit website for additional resources on cannabis and other substances. Many teens are unclear on the effects and harms of cannabis, which could put them at an increased risk. Talk to your teen about common myths and what the evidence says. For example, weed is natural and so it's harmless is a myth about cannabis. In fact, early and regular cannabis use can affect the developing teen brain and is related to mental health problems. Another common myth is the assumption that everyone is using weed. When in fact in Lanark, Leeds, and Grenville, 26% of grade, grades 9 to 12 students have tried cannabis in the last 12 months, and 74% have not used. Another myth is that weed helps you focus. We know that regular cannabis use impairs thinking, attention, and memory. Weed is not addictive and does not consume users is another myth when in fact one in six adolescents who use cannabis daily or nearly daily will develop a cannabis use disorder. The final myth is that weed makes you a better driver. It's safer than driving after using alcohol. We know that cannabis use impairs the ability to drive and is linked with collisions. Many car crashes involving teenagers are caused by inexperience and errors in judgment. When these factors are combined with alcohol, cannabis, other drugs, or a combination, the risks are increased. Parents can start a conversation with their children about impaired driving. Many parents have had the conversation about impaired driving and alcohol, and it's important to include cannabis and other factors that can impair or distract while driving in these conversations. Only 11% of parents surveyed said they had discussed the risks of driving under the influence of cannabis with their teenagers. This actually dropped to 4% when teens themselves were asked whether they had discussed impaired driving with their parents. What parents can do is develop a plan with their teen for how they can get home safely. For example, calling for a ride home, taking a taxi, or arranging for a designated driver. Teens can also use public transportation and rideshare services when available. In summary, here are the strategies that we have talked about. Be a positive role model, be engaged, talk about it, set clear and realistic expectations, be in the know and know the facts. We all have hard days and make mistakes when using these strategies. If it doesn't always go as planned, don't get discouraged. Try again.